each day we're having a student uh, take notes and, and kind of summarize their impressions on, on, the, on the day session. And, and today that student is Sam Abernethy. Uh, he uh, has provided not, not only the take home messages that you see here, but some other summary material. These summaries will be available to people through the, um, at the end of the workshop. But these were some of the take home messages Sam highlighted. You can read them there. Um, a point Jim Williams made about the critical aspect of a two thirds reduction in emissions, no matter what. Um, Nature based solutions being typically less costly, closer to, to deployment actually being deployed today, but uh, more vulnerable to reversal, something that the first workshop discussed. Uh, a broad range of CO2 to value approaches. And then um, I think one of the one of the, I think the really critical messages for me is the kind of diversified portfolio of industrial and hybrid approaches that we all know will be needed um, to reach the Paris goals that none of these technologies will be sufficient on their own. I think everyone today could could draw up their own list, but thank you, Sam, for doing that. I'm going to stop. Uh, I want to thank the panelists and the speakers. I'm going to turn it back over to Sarah, who has some some summary to, uh, summary points and a bit of information about the next two days. We'll delve into some of the technologies in more detail tomorrow. So take it away, Sarah. I would like to uh, thank all of our speakers today. And uh, uh, Rob, also, I'd like to thank you for facilitating. Um, uh, before we move on, I would also like to uh, thank our workshop technical advisory committee for this event. Um, that includes Tim Barkholt from ExxonMobil, Richard Brown from Bank of America, Shafiq Jaffer from Total, Ajay Mehta from Shell, and Jennifer Milne, Richard Sassoon, Maxine Lim, and Mickey Yu from Precorp. I would also like to thank the Strategic Energy Alliance, the Stanford Carbon Removal Initiative, the Precord Institute for Energy, and the Stanford Woods Institute for the Environment for sponsoring this event. So um, thanks, thank you very much for joining us today. Tomorrow's theme is engineered and hybrid solutions. What is new and what is at the edge? We're gonna have a very different format tomorrow. Um, we're gonna have four sessions, um, one on direct air capture, one on BEX, one on carbon mineralization, and one on bio-inspired solutions for carbon. They will be 45 minutes long each, one following right after another. And in each of those sessions, we will have uh, two speakers for 10 minutes each, and then um, a facilitated conversation will occur for the next uh, 22 or 23 minutes. So it'll be a very different format from, from today, but we're hoping that in those uh, both presentations and in the ensuing conversation, we will get some um, interesting perspectives on um, what is really at the edge. So um, I see that we actually still have a couple minutes uh, left uh, today. Um, I'm gonna suggest we have a couple of questions that have come in from the audience. And if our panel is still with us, I would actually still like to pose a couple of these questions to the panelists. Um, so I, I can't tell from my vantage point if you're all there, but I'm gonna ask the question anyway. Um, do we have all, how do we get all of the necessary parties involved in the energy system to work collectively to find optimum solutions versus working individually leading to suboptimal solutions? Looking at the scale of what we have to do, where we have to go the only way forward is 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 uh with some sort of joint venture so uh and I, and the and the discussions are underway and we heard uh, damien talk about um these sort of collaborations with uh with the cement companies etc cetera, etc cetera. that that's happening anyway and, and looking at the scale we, we are going to have to um uh, in, in terms of mitigation of risk and in terms of mitigation in terms of uh, costs the only way to go forward is, is, to, uh, is to do this in, in joint ventures. I think uh, there's no other way. I think that's right. And, um, you know, I talked about it a little bit during my, my few pages. Uh, partnership, in my mind, will be crucial. And um, it's, it's not going to be like forced marriage. It's going to be mixed marriages uh, in between companies that wouldn't necessarily work together in the past. But the nature of the work that is required um, is so broad and, and, and different that it will require different players to come together and own a different piece of the value chain so that your overall risk of the project goes down and cost for everybody goes down. If people understand that, understand the complexity of those and understand and accept to collaborate on those, I think that they will achieve better value than trying to do that on their own. 
Yeah, I think you see a lot of these up. partnerships. Yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. a lot of these are not the the, the common partnerships as we've seen in the last uh, you know, few decades in, in in oil and gas, particularly. You know, this is now with landowners, uh, you know, farmers and and forestry owners and 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 uh, you know, not traditional uh, partnerships, and even down to to people like you know the Cargoes of the world and some of these big uh, agricultural and and food supply um, companies. So. You know, these partnerships do, will happen um, and, and, and also we're not it's not that we're not used to collaborating right in safety uh, in this industry particularly we collaborate very well to to avoid incidents occurring because it's for the common good and so it is it is possible and we do do it now I think it's uh, it just takes time okay we've got another question that came in earlier but I think this is a good uh, place to pose it in California, where many of us are living right now, we're probably headed for another dreadful wire fire, fire season. Um, there's definitely the need for fuel management in our forests. Um, rather than simple controlled burns, is there an opportunity here to haul the deadwood out and burn it in Bex facilities to gain meaningful progress on both fronts, both forest management and carbon sequestering? Thoughts? It feels like uh, I have to address that uh, with our project Mendota. Um, we are currently in, in discussion with the state of California and the fire departments across several counties in, in across the state of California to see first how we could include some of the forestry residue in a plant that we're designing in Mendota. So not only we will have agricultural waste from orchard trees like almond trees and apricot trees, but also some of the uh, millions of trees that are laying dead uh, in forest and along the the, uh, the mountain range uh, to complement around 20% of that into the plant. So that's going forward, you could actually have a plant along the state that's actually only consume uh, forest residue. The, there are some logistics issues uh, with regards to accessing that biomass and the cost uh, of that fuel will be much higher. Uh, but if the state is willing to, uh, to support this with uh, uh, you know, combination of green bonds and access to cheaper capital. I think these are things that should be considered. And, you know, the, the, the configuration, technical configuration we have in Mendota is by no means the only one that we can do. There are some other ways you can uh, treat the biomass, uh, but certainly the fuel is there and should be used. Great, thank you. Any others that want to um, address that question and also talk about scale? I think anything to do with biomass, you, you're going to have to deal with the fact that uh, the energy density of that uh, that feedstock is very low, and transport logistics is, is a main issue here, right? And hauling these, uh, these these feedstocks long distance are, are, are going to have a CO2 impact as well. So there is technology plays here about what you know, looking at miniaturization, right? Can you actually densify that biomass at source at a smaller scale, and then transport? You know, it's called a you know, like this paralysis oil or some more dense product to a central facility. So I think there is a lot of technology plays that could help you. I could comment briefly, uh, Sarah, if that's all right. And I, I agree with um, with what you said, David, about density. So that energy, energy density is obviously important. But I think this is an example of something that makes a great deal of sense on paper. And I would hope on practice, we know that there's, there's uh, an opportunity to reduce fire risk by using some of this biomass. But to actually accomplish it, it's difficult, right? You have to collect that biomass. You have issues with public perception resistance. Um, and frankly, a lot of the land, a lot of the forest and land in, in California isn't Californian land, it's, it's federal land through the national forest and such. So it isn't, it isn't California's to control. So there are lots of different, um, lots of different levers that have to be, be pulled and things that have to line up to make this cost effective. But in, in, in principle, I think it's a really good question. Okay, well, I'd like to uh, thank everyone else uh, one more time for participating today. I'd like to thank, thank the audience um, for your participation as well and all your great uh, questions. Um, thank you so much for joining us today, and we hope to see you again tomorrow.